Good morning, everyone. Good evening to wherever you are. Good afternoon, whichever. Um, wherever you happen to be, uh, thanks for your service, Dow Fox Anonymous, first and foremost. Um, and I just want to say that as we're going through the concepts, there's a good chance that your area does something different than is in the service manual or in the concepts, depending on what country you're in or what state or province or whatever. So if you get active in service, make sure you get their handbook. They might call it the local service manual. They might call it their bylaws. They might call it their policies and procedures, their guidelines, their current practices. There's a million names out there. But uh, what you should not do is just say, well, Billy said we should do this because that, that will definitely guarantee that somebody will uh, be throwing that handbook in your face. So please uh, become familiar with that. But at the end of the day, the underarching spiritual principles of the steps, traditions, and concepts should be the same around the world, every corner of the globe, uh, the same principles. So uh, we're going to talk about, because everyone knows um, that when I talk about the concepts, I always say they're divided into four parts. The first part is concepts one to five. That's kind of like the AA group's Bill of Rights. That uh, gives you, tells you that the groups are in charge. It tells you how the groups are in charge through the delegates in concept two. It tells you how we give our leaders right a decision in concept three. It talks about how important participation is in concept four, especially making note that the groups have the largest concentration of authority and voting power. And then concept five is the right of appeal and petition. The second section of the concepts is six through eight. And that is really about the complicated yet simple relationship between the board and the conference or the conference and the board. The third section of the concepts is concepts nine, 10, and 11. That really is a lot of suggestions on how the board should carry out its responsibilities. And concept 12 is article 12 of the conference charter. That is one of the things that can't be changed without 75% uh, permission of the of written permission of the groups in writing. Um, so concept 12, also known as the general warranties of the conference. Those are basically, you could throw them even though it's not in the book, if you were dividing up the concepts, it would be in those four parts. So six, seven, and eight. Six, seven, and eight, probably the most important of putting it all together because it talks about this complicated yet simple relationship. Um, so, Sydney, if you would read concept six, that would be great. Sure, let me just come through the book. All right, concept six. On behalf of AA as a whole, our general service conference has the principal responsibility for the maintenance of our world services. And it traditionally has the final decision respecting large matters of general policy and finance. But the conference also recognizes that the chief initiative and the active responsibility in most of these matters should be exercised primarily by the trustee members of the conference when they act among themselves as the General Service Board of Alcoholics Anonymous. Thank you. So if you all have a service manual or something else with the concept in front of you, or maybe you Google, Google these 12 concepts and you have the ability to make notes on whatever kind of screen you're using. The most important thing uh, regarding concept six is those words, final decision. Who has the final decision? And it says the general service conference. And what does it have the final decision over? Large matters of policy and finance. So let's talk about 
those three things. Who? The General Service Conference. In North America, that's about 135 people, give or take each year, depending on the number of staff that participate. There might be new staff that aren't voting yet. But remember, we went over this in concept four. 93 of those in the US and Canada are area delegates. They represent the groups directly. And they're like 70% of the voting body. And that's because concept four says in reasonable proportion to the authority they have to carry out. So the groups have the biggest authority because that's who Bill and Bob left their role to. Then we have the 21 trustees, then we have the six directors, and then we have about 15 AA or grapevine staff. So when we say the general service conference, we just don't mean the delegates, we just don't mean the trustees, and we just don't mean GSO staff and grapevine staff. We mean all of them. All of those voters making up one group conscience. And then it says final decision. So regardless of the complicated legal arrangement, which is really nothing, the trustees are the only legal body that own AWS, the AA Grapevine, and the General Service Board. Nobody else has any legal authority, real legal authority. But the charter is clear that the trustees should listen to the conference, that the conference has ultimate authority. And if you have your service manual on a searchable PDF type of uh, tablet, phone, whatever, you'll see that ultimate is used a lot of times talking about the conference's authority. And then what do they have authority over? Large matters of policy and finance. So let's go to the second part about the active chief initiator, the general service board, the trustees. That is basically saying what the general service conference does not have authority over. They don't have authority over micromanaging. And anyone who's heard me talk before knows I always say, there's only two things that make you an alcoholic. Your allergy to alcohol and the mental obsession that comes with alcoholism. But there's a lot of other characteristics that it seems are popular amongst alcoholics. Uh, they don't make you an alcoholic, but it sure seems like a lot of alcoholics have them. Controlling and micromanaging definitely fall into that bucket bucket we have a lot of alcoholics who are very controlling and micromanaging and i admit myself when i go to my professional life the one thing aa has helped me with the most is trying to remember to not be controlling not be micromanaging let my employees be the best employees they can be stay out of their way my job is to make their job easier Get rid of any hurdles that are in their way. Get rid of any thing that's stopping them from being the best they can be. But it's definitely not my job to be an expert more than they are. Because most of them know more about their particular subject than I do. So we don't need to ask the area delegates what new carpet we should buy for the office in New York. And they don't need to order the furniture or anything like that large matters of policy and finance. The other thing I want to stress in concept six is there is a line there. It's like on the second full page of concept six down at the bottom. It says, while our aim is a spiritual one, we can only reach it by being an effective business operation. So what does that mean? That means contrary to what you've been told, losing money is not spiritual. Being irresponsibly, being irresponsible financially is not spiritual. And a lot of times people think, oh, but we're a nonprofit. Well, that doesn't mean lose money. That means no individual gets to profit from the organization's work. That means any money that we make above our expenses, we reinvest back into our mission. Um, but it also means that you can't just say we're out there doing God's work and everything will work out. Um, I am a person who believes that God does not take care of AA. I believe God takes care of us. And we've been given the immense responsibility of taking care of AA. 
um, that we just can't pray for something to go right. Um, we can hope that the people who have been put in leadership positions are taking care of AA. The other thing I want to say is that sometimes, you know, when we lose money, sometimes when we talk about the seventh tradition, all we talk about in the seventh tradition is telling people how much money to put in the basket, telling people we should be self-supporting, um, telling people we make contributions and not donations, all that stuff. There is another part to, to Tradition 7, and it's found in Concept 6, and that is spending AA money. And I'll go back to another characteristic that a lot of alcoholics seem to have. Alcoholics seem to like to spend other people's money. It seems it's a lot easier for them to spend other people's money than their own. But I would tell you that there is an immense responsibility after groups and individuals have struggled to put money in that basket. Whoever is spending the money has the real responsibility to be super responsible and ethical and accountable and transparent in everything they do. Um, Sydney, could you read concept seven? Concept seven. The conference recognizes that the charter and the bylaws of the general service board are legal instruments that the trustees are thereby fully empowered to manage and conduct all of the world service affairs of Alcoholics Anonymous. It is further understood that the conference charter itself is not a legal document, that it relies instead upon the force of tradition and the power of the AA purse for its final effectiveness. Thank you. All right, so let's go to the most confusing thing about Concept 7. It starts off by saying the, the bylaws and the charter are legal instruments. But I just spent like a bunch of weeks telling all of you that the conference charter is not a legal document. So what charter are they talking about? They're not talking about the legal charter. I mean, the conference charter. Back when AA was first incorporated, in the state of New York, another word for charter was certificate of incorporation. So when they say the bylaws and the charter, what they're really saying is the bylaws and the certificate of incorporation are legal instruments, not the conference charter. Conference charter is a spiritual handshake between the groups and the trustees. Um, now we have that out of the way. The trustees do have immense spiritual uh, and legal authority. I want to say in every service structure that has a general service board, except for one, only the trustees have legal status. In the service manual, we talk about the groups being shareholders, like stockholders. But only in a spiritual sense. They're not legal stockholders, except for Ireland. Ireland changed their charter a couple of years ago. In Ireland, the delegates, the conference is a legal entity. And so their legal, their conference could legally give instructions to their board. But I'm gonna talk about the US and Canada and everybody else. The trustees have immense authority. They're the only ones who have any legal standing, any legal privity, any legal status regarding doing business for the General Service Board of AA, the AA Grapevine, or the AA World Services Board, or the directors that they elect. Um, in, and so it's important to realize that, and thank God we elect good trustees and Thank God they take their job seriously and thank God they dedicate an awful lot of time and they don't get paid. Um, I, 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 would, I, would, I would say they don't get paid, but I used to, I, I now correct myself. 
I was never paid in money to be a trustee, but I was probably paid more money than I could ever make in my entire life spiritually. Um, but they are giving of their own time. And, uh, but there's an important section in, in, in concept seven about the veto power of the trustees. And I want to stress two things there. Number one, it gives an example in the narrative of like the president of the United States having veto power. Uh, if I could ever have a conversation with Bill W., I probably would ask him to take that out. Only because the president of the United States has individual veto authority. Just as an individual can veto something. Our chair of the board, whether it's of the grapevine of AA World Services or the chair of the trustees, the general service board, do not have individual veto authority if the conference takes an action. Last year, it kind of happened at our conference and the chair did not handle it great. And this year, the chair acknowledged that. The board could reject something the conference tells it to do. And it's spelled out in concept seven. But there are only a couple of reasons why the board is ever given the suggestion that it might not want to listen to the conference. The first one is the conference told them to do something illegal. The board are all governed by the laws of the United States and the state of New York. Um, they have to act as a fiduciary. They have to act under the guidelines of the attorney general's office of uh, the state of New York. The second is if um, the conference wanted it to spend money over what the allotted budget was, um, the trustees have a right to step in and, and, uh, and not do something. Um, but let's just be honest. We just elected the delegates for the 72nd General Service Conference. The first four were tests. So you could say the 68th real one. The trustees have never rejected something the conference told them to do, ever. 72 years. They have followed their instructions, which what are their instructions? The advisory actions that come out every year from the conference. So Sydney, could you read concept eight? Concept eight, the trustees of the general service board act in two primary capacities. A, with respect to the large matters of overall policy and finance, they are the principal planners and administrators. They and their primary committees directly manage these affairs. B, but with respect to our separately incorporated and constantly active services, the relation of the trustees is mainly that of full stock ownership and of custodial oversight, which they exercise through their ability to elect all directors of these entities. So a couple of things. If you have the most recent service manual, there's a, a, a um, uh, footnote saying that the trustees don't own full stock ownership of those corporations anymore. That changed in 1961. See, the AA World Services and the Grapevine used to be directly owned by the company. They were subsidiaries. They were owned by the General Service Board. AAWS and AA Grapevine are individual standalone companies. Uh, they are owned by the 21 individual trustees, their member corporations. So who owns AA World Services and the AA Grapevine? The trustees, but not the General Service Board as a company. The individual trustees, they're the owners. Um, and they meet once a year to elect the directors. So in that first section, section A, there's a couple of important words. And it's kind of the opposite of um, 
concept six, and I'm going to walk slowly through this. Um, remember, if you look back at concept six, the conference has final decision. Final. And what is it have final on? Large matters of policy and finance. That's what it says. So what do the trustees do? The trustees plan, manage, and administer. That's what they do from section A of concept eight. They plan, manage, and administer. That's their job. That means they do file the taxes. That means they do, they, they do buy the health insurance for the employees. That means they do make sure the employees have a good pension or retirement program. That means the trustees do order the new furniture or the staff does, the trustees approve it. They plan, and ma plan manage, and administer. What the second part of concept eight is saying is that the two boards that operate under the trustees, AA World Services and the AA Grapevine, by their bylaws, four of the trustees, four of their bylaw of their members have to be trustees. They each have nine or 10 directors. So four have to be trustees, but who are the others? There's three non-trustee directors. They're AA members who have service experience and a particular business or professional skill. Um, they have that. Um, then the general manager and the staff coordinator are both members of the AA World Services Board. But it's the trustees that legally elect them into those positions. It is, it is the trustees that do that. Um, if the trustees are not happy with the corporate boards, they would have to unelect, um, they would have to unelect one of these or multiple directors and say, you're not doing a good job. And that would require a special meeting um, to let that happen. But the trustees do not micromanage AA World Services and the AA Grapevine. They get regular reports about what they're up to. They can give feedback but they can't instruct them what to do unless they called for a special meeting of the members, then they could do that. Um, so that is a little complicated, um, but because these particular ones are so complicated, um, I know that the questions are more important than anything I could say. So I am gonna open it up for questions on all three uh, concepts. And this is small enough where you can ask your question directly. That's not a problem. Julie, could you please expand on what is meant by a large matter of general policy or finance for that matter in concept six? Like what would constitute, what, if you could give an example or something? Uh, well, a perfect example I think um, would be the preamble this year. The grapevine board owns that intellectual property. Um, that's their property. They own it. They have the trademark or the copy. They have the copyright on it. And when people suggested or wrote in and, and asked to change it, they decided this is too big a deal. This is a large matter of policy. We're going to send it to the conference. Um, another example would be conference approved literature. The trustees do not have the authority to change conference approved literature. Um, they have to go to the conference, even if they want a piece of conference approved literature changed. The reserve fund. Our reserve fund, by recommendation of the trustees, but you know, uh, approved by the conference for a long time now, 
has been nine to 12 months, the low end being nine and the high end being 12. Last year, we had to take almost $4 million out of the reserve fund. The trustees used their right of decision to do that because the AA bills had to be paid and the rent had to be paid and the employees had to be paid. And we were in the middle of a global pandemic. But should the trustees think that maybe based on what we learned during COVID that it should be more than nine to 12 months, you would probably see a recommendation coming from the trustees to the conference saying, let's change the low end and the high end of the reserve fund. So those would be good examples. Hi, thanks for unmuting me, Sydney. Uh, Billy, um, what is the um, what is the kind of um, passageway, or how do people end up becoming trustees? What is the process? But I mean, maybe you could share from um, explain that from a sort of technical perspective, and then if you're willing to share your your own personal experience of that, please. Uh, sure. And you mean for me to share it about the U.S. and Canada? Yeah. Okay. Um, so if you remember, we have 21 trustees. We have seven Class A non-alcoholic and 14 Class B. If we ever were to elect an alcoholic chair of the board, we technically could one day wind up with 22, uh, with 22 trustees. But for now, we have 21. So the 14 um, alcoholic trustees, we have three different types, remember. We have a regional trustee who was elected by one of the eight regions in the US and Canada, okay? Um, we have eight regions, the Northeast, the Southeast, the Southwest, the East Central, the West Central, the Pacific, and then Eastern and Western Canada. Then we have two class, two class B alcoholic trustees um, who are called um, at-large trustees, one for the US and one for Canada. And then we have four general service trustees that are class B alcoholic. So 14, three different types of alcoholics, class A, one type. Is, am I, are you with me so far? Yes. Okay. All right. You, you, you got it. All right. So um, let's talk about the class A trustees, the non-alcoholics. When we're looking for class A trustees, we send a note out to the fellowship. And we say, if you have anyone you'd like to recommend as a class A trustee, please, please do. Please have them send in this resume form. And um, we're usually looking for people in the corrections or parole world or the justice system or the clergy or the medical or social work or uh, accounting, finance who always has to be a class H trustee. Um, the type of people we're looking for aren't really surprising. They're the kind of people that run into alcoholics all the time. There are people who run into alcoholics in their daily life. And let's face it, people like us, who do we run into? We run into judges, doctors, social workers, wardens, parole officers, all kinds of people like that. Um, once we get all those resumes, we review them and decide who do we want to interview. And then we call them to New York for interviews. And we actually let them attend a board weekend and see how it, what it's like and what goes on. Um, 
And then the trustees nominating committee interviews all those people and makes a recommendation to the general service board as to the one or two people we want to select to be class A's. And then if the general service board approves their recommendation, the general service board sends it to the conference and asks the conference to approve the people that they've selected. Regional trustees are elected at the conference and they're nominated by their area. And then at the conference, the voting people for regional trustees are the regional delegates from that region and an equal number of members of the trustees nominating committee and an equal number of members of the conference committee on trustees. And they hold that election right there at the conference. Trustees at large is the same as regionals. They're nominated by their area. However, every delegate from that country votes for them, not just uh, the region. So for all the Canadian delegates, the United States, all the United States delegates. Um, General Service Trust, which I was um, in, um, uh, about like explaining my uh, trustee has to um, Oops, I think we lost him. <laughs> we'll see if he back i got kicked out am i back you're back you're back yeah awesome so a general service trustee have service experience they don't have to be a past delegate just saying that some people think they do they don't i have to be a delegate i was a panel 49 delegate which if we're like the 72nd year delegates now then I'd like you to believe that I was in kindergarten when I was a delegate. Um, but that means that in 1999 and 2000, I was a delegate. Um, in 2008, the AWS board was looking for directors. I was selected to be a director. And then four years later, the board was looking for a general service trustee. You have to have been a We lost him again. So I am one of those general service trustees who had business experience and service experience. I happen to be a past delegate. I was probably brought on because the board at the time had great challenges with our retirement programs and our pensions. Our pensions were very underfunded. Um, so that's probably why I was chosen because I had a lot of experience with the company I worked for uh, changing their retirement program and kind of right-sizing the ship, if you were to say. And today, uh, because of a lot of great work from a lot of people, the retirement program for the United States and Canada General Service Office employees is in very good financial health and no longer underfunded. So I hope that helps out a little bit. I did have a question that was sent to me. Um, uh, whoever sent it, it erased from my uh, um, chat, unfortunately. And I'm not going to remember it. So if you could write it again, thank you, please. Anyone else have questions while we're waiting for that one to be written? I know it was about the conference. Um, uh, hi. 
This is Soldheim and Alcoholic. I have a question about these uh, concepts uh, working in the level of the meeting. Uh, that, uh, I mean, I don't know exactly that that is why we uh, do 75% vote in business meetings or is it half plus one? Okay. Does it have an every AA entity? Every AA entity is entitled to choose their own process. At a lot of groups, they use fifty percent plus one. At a lot of groups, at most service uh, entities in the United States and Canada, they use two thirds, not seventy-five percent. Two thirds is substantial unanimity. The trustees in the U.S. and the conference in the U.S. use two-thirds except for a couple of things. The traditions and the steps and Article 12 of the conference charter can only be changed with 75% approval from all the groups. Um, but for the most part, for substantial unanimity, we use two-thirds. At a lot of large home groups in the US and Canada, they'll use 50% plus one for like regular decisions that are not big. But if it's for like the makeup of the group or the policies of the group, they might use two thirds. Thank you very much. You're welcome. How can the conference be responsible for such large matters when they only meet once a year? Do they meet and discuss these often? Um, no, what they expect is the trustees to do all the work during the year and bring all the background information to the conference. And then the conference committee will meet and review all that background information and decide whether they're gonna make a recommendation to the full conference or not. That's how that works. The only time they meet before the conference, by the way, the conference committees, the only time they meet is they might have a conference call or a Zoom call before the conference to work on housekeeping issues. What's their schedule going to be? What order are they going to deal with their agenda? What breaks are they going to take? Things like that. But all the business is discussed at the conference. Um, the conference committees the first two days of the conference, they meet for six hours alone and they go over their background material and make those decisions. Next question. Uh, Billy, it, it takes me too long to type on my screen. <laughs> Sorry. Um, could you please address how or if the General Service Conference in America takes into effect how it may affect other uh, decisions made by other conferences in, in other countries, or if there is any effect at all? Um, uh, well, that's an awesome question. I would say up until now, no, uh, but this change of the preamble has other countries saying, hey, you might've wanted to ask what we felt about this. This is a pretty big, important decision. Right now, the 63 individual conferences are autonomous. Um, the way we keep the literature the same is that AAWS owns the intellectual copyrights on all of them. And when they give a license to foreign general service boards, um, they make them agree to not change the literature in the license. Um, there is a world service meeting every two years. It rotates around the world every four years. The other off, the other uh, every four years, it's in New York. 
Um, but that world service meeting is just a sharing meeting of two representatives of each general service office. Um, they're not a deliberative body and don't vote for group conscience for AA as a whole. So, um, but I think with the preamble and other things, uh, that's a question that people are going to have to think about now, Sydney. Thank you. Any other questions? Did you find being trustee a fulfilling experience and how did it support your growth in AA? So many great questions come out of this little meeting. Um, so yes, extremely. I've often, I think I'm on tape that I've said, you know, people have asked me, what's it like being chair of the AA World Services Board? Well, some days it's the greatest day in the world when you wake up in the morning. And other days it's like that upside down triangle, somebody hammered it into my head. Um, so I often say you get to see the best and worst of AA all the time. Um, I was asked when I rotated out, I'll tell you this little story. Um, I was asked, what did I learn being a trustee at a conference one time? And my answer back then is the same answer today, um, which was yesterday was November 6th. Uh, today is November 7th. 2021 and today thousands of alcoholics all over the world will go to their first meeting they might get a bad cup of coffee or tea and an uncomfortable chair or they might even be on zoom but i know that they'll be welcome to the fellowship of the spirit that saved my life i know that's happening right now as we are in this meeting and I know a year from now, a lot of those people will celebrate their first anniversary. And we all know that the first anniversary is pretty special in Alcoholics Anonymous. And at an anniversary meeting, you might see people with their parents or their spouse or their kids. And those people have tears in their eyes. And they can't believe that this very odd looking group of people was able to give their family something that they couldn't buy and they couldn't love. That all the love in the world and all the money in the world couldn't give their family member sobriety. And yet this weird group of people that looks like a collection of the Cheers Bar, Burning Man, and Comic Con. Um, has given their family something that no one could give them. I know that. But I also know that yesterday was November 6th, 2021. And at this very moment, there are a lot of people who are not alive anymore that were alive yesterday, simply because they suffer from the same disease as me, as alcoholism. And that things happened last night that people can't change that have lost their physical liberty for a long time. When I told the story, I had no idea that three years later, during month two of COVID, 
um, that I would get a phone call. My brother is sober. His husband was sober a long time and then went out for a couple of years. And that I would be sitting at my kitchen table the second month of COVID in May of 2020. And my brother screaming and the police and, um, and that, you know, my brother-in-law checked into a hotel outside of New York City and took his life. And, you know, that, you know, a week later, I'm at an outdoor funeral in New Jersey, watching my brother unable to let go of his husband's casket. Like the 12 and 12 describes us, the, out, the disease as the rapacious creditor. And, um, you know, that view of my brother unable to let go of his husband's casket etched in my mind forever. So I love AA. I love all the fun we have. I love the people in AA I play poker with. I love those guys. I love the guys in AA that I play uh, uh, golf with. I love going to meetings. I love going to AA conventions around the world. But sometimes it's easy to forget how deadly this disease is. And um, that's the thing I learned the most as a trustee. And the other thing I learned is it's really alarming how many alcoholics die of alcoholism. But what's more alarming to me is how many alcoholics die without ever hearing about Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's something that maybe I can participate in and letting a few more people know that AA is here. So I hope that answers your question. Um, would you speak to the power of the purse? Um, sure. If your general service board is not following instructions and refuses to listen to the conference, then the only choice the AA groups have is to not contribute. And since general service boards are only supposed to get money from literature sales and contributions, that is the ultimate check and balance. I'm sorry I passed over that. Um, and thank you for reminding me. It's the ultimate check and balance. It doesn't happen a lot. And I'm not going to name the countries right now that have had some problems the last couple of years, but that power of the purse has been used in a couple of places. What would you suggest to sponsor on how to speak with sponsees about the concepts? Um, the first thing I would say is that we have too many people who go right from the steps to the concepts. You can't understand the concepts without understanding the traditions. So I think the number one priority of the sponsor after you take someone through the big book is to then take them through the traditions. I do not believe everybody needs to be an expert on the concepts in Alcoholics Anonymous. They were written specifically about our world service affairs. Can they be applied to the group? Sure. Um, but I would spend a hell of a lot more time on the traditions than the concepts to the average AA member who may never serve beyond the group level. But I would let them be aware of them and I would talk about them at a 100,000 foot level and let them ask questions. But um, I'm not a person who believes that in-depth study of the concepts is required for every AA member. Any other questions? Up, oh, I just got one. Um, so I'm just gonna ask, I'm just gonna, 
Yes, my experience is that it is very common for a lot of people to get involved in service with really no experience with the traditions. And they try to apply the concepts, but they're voting on AA policy and they have little experience with the traditions and knowing what kept us here or what has kept us here and what has prevented us from going the way of the Washingtonians or the Oxford group. So I, I couldn't be more committed to the traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous. Hey, and Billy, sometimes I'm just going to tell you, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, would you recommend uh, any specific work uh, outside of the 12 and 12, like language of yes. the heart, for example, yes. or, uh, on this type of thing? Yes, uh, on the subject that I'm talking about, and I mentioned, we talked about a couple of the traditions a couple of weeks ago is you have to read AA Comes of Age. You have to know where we made all our big mistakes. You have to know that, that AA Comes of Age is a document that documents our big mistakes between 1935 and 1946. Um, I would also recommend Language of the Heart, especially the index in there that has like all the problems that we run into in AA. And you can go to a Bill W. article. I would also tell you to go on the AA.org website and get the traditions illustrated, which is, in a lot of people's opinion, better. Even the narrative, forget the pictures, are, is better than the 12 and 12, help people understand the traditions. So all of those things. Uh, the AA group pamphlet is super important, as is problems other than alcohol. And I would tell people, you're not going to win converts overnight. I had a discussion with someone three weeks ago and woke up and saw a change on a website that they told me about. And I was like, wow. But sometimes things don't happen quickly. You have to, uh, you never know. <laughs> 